Hey, everybody, and thanks for joining us on what is this sort of gloomy June day uh, in Seattle. I hope it's sunnier where you are. It's uh, flag my name day. Is, it's flag day. Uh, I'm Jake Milstein, and today uh, we've invited you to a discussion about what to do when your vendor has a cyber attack, uh, which is something that happens more and more and more. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we do a, a research project twice a year and we do it for healthcare specifically about, um, you know, what, what has caused attacks, what, you know, how bad guys are getting in. And one of the things where we see it, unfortunately, just hockey stick upping, um, is, is cyber attacks through vendors. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the ones that have happened. Um, but, you know, big, big problem um, and a problem that's growing, you know, and we'll talk about why it's growing and the like. So, you know, I, um, so. Um, OK, things to know. Um, if you haven't joined our webinars before, um, you'll notice that on the right is a chat. Uh, go ahead and let us know where you're joining from. Say hi. We love to know where people are joining from. Our, uh, uh, the person who joined from the farthest distance away this year joined from New Zealand. So, uh, but so far I see Kansas and North Carolina and San Jose, um, and so it's awesome. Also, uh, anybody who registered for this event will get a recording. We'll also put this on our YouTube channel when we're done, um, and you will get the slide deck. We'll send out the slide deck from this um, uh, as well. Um, one more thing to know about the chat. Um, one of my roles here is I love interrupting uh, the panelists and asking the questions that you put in the chat, so don't be shy. Uh, as we go, ask questions. I love interrupting them. Uh, happy to do it. Um, if you don't know us, Critical Insight uh, defends critical infrastructure against cyber attacks. That means we help organizations prepare for a cyber attack. We help them detect one quickly from our security operations centers, and we help them respond decisively. Um, Joining me today is Mike Hamilton uh, and Fred Langston, both of whom founded the company. Um, Mike is now our CISO. He was the uh, uh, CISO of the city of Seattle before he created the company. Fred Langston is our chief product officer now. We're joined by good friend of the company, Mike Almvig, who is the director of information services in Skagit County, Washington, um, and uh, has a lot of passion around this topic because, well, he's dealt with vendor breaches and vendor issues. And my name again is Jake Milstein. Uh, I uh, am CMO um, and I host all of our events. Mike, do you want to talk people through a little bit about that, the headlines around this and what the what the problems are? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I personally always like to start from some articles from the news since I go through a lot of news to do that daily news blast. Uh, but there's there's some categories of things that have been happening with third parties that are starting to look like trends that are starting to be addressed. Frankly, um, in, in some regulatory ways and in some just kind of competitive differentiation ways, right? You need to show your security papers if you're gonna do business with anybody. With. Well, here's a bunch of examples of some vendors uh, having their uh, product compromised. So we've all heard about Okta, um, uh, custom implants, right? Solar Winds was kind of the poster child for this, where their software got backdoored and then distributed. Here's a fun one: millions of PC motherboards sold with a firmware backdoor. That one's that one's going to be really interesting. So uh, your vendor can get compromised, and their product can get compromised. And because we've seen a couple of instances of a backdoor product going out, you know, something compromised being sent out as an update, um, that ends up on your network. Go to the next slide, Jake. <clears throat> okay, and here's where your also solar winds there is the poster child, but here are some companies that um, got backdoored and their software was sent out, not just a theoretical possibility, it did happen. Um, some of these are, I, I think, a little dubious um tyler technologies uh was uh hacked and um the suspicion is that because they had so tyler technologies supplies a lot of products to local governments cities counties municipalities things like that and the fear was that someone was in their network long enough to watch 
um, their uh, uh, their support uh, teams logging in to products that were all deployed out in local governments and finding out that there was a single password being used and some other bad practices and things like that. So that wasn't really a product that was sent out, but it gave access to all the products that were already implemented. Blackbaud company uh, uh, was um, handled a lot of financial material for the health sector, for philanthropies, for nonprofits, things like that. They had all their records stolen, which forced uh, a lot of consternation, especially in the health sector. Because as you will see, if you were in the health sector and your records are held somewhere else and that somewhere else gets compromised, you have to file the breach report and you go on the HIPAA wall of shame and all that stuff. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Kaseya was an interesting one too. Kaseya, an MSP, a managed service provider, so nominally outsourced IT. So they have many, 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 many customers. And this tactic of going through an MSP has been coming back every once in a while. Uh, you will remember that I think it was about four years ago, um, 19 cities in Texas all simultaneously got ransomware because they went through their MSP, all right? The third party was compromised, provided access to all of those customers, and so they got hit. So again, if someone else is holding your records, you're probably going to be on the hook to report. So um, these are all very... Um, um, uh, very fresh uh, articles here, except that one that ransomware attack on a debt collection firm. Um, actually, I think that's pretty recent as well. Uh, but again, when you're holding information that may be considered financial, personal financial information, personal health information, and now privacy information because of the statutes coming out of California and other states, California Consumer Privacy Act, you are in trouble even if someone else got hacked and your records were disclosed because they were being held by that other organization. Yeah. So I like to point out Go ahead. Yeah, I like to point, I want to point out that the the ransomware attack on the debt collection firm uh, resulted in 650 companies mm -hmm. having to file a breach notification. So there are certain things that you may be certain vendors you may use that are in a field that have three or four other competitors. In other words, everybody is concentrated in those few vendors. So one attack successful on a vendor like that can impact hundreds, if not thousands of organizations. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'll add to that one. I, I actually talked to that company at a conference and I said to them, you know, after that breach happened, did you lose a bunch of customers? And one of the guys said, well, where are they gonna go? So. Yeah, to your point, exactly. All right, so, you know, when you look at all of those headlines, there are really four scenarios that, that play out there. Scenario number one, um, and, and just like that, that, the finance one, the debt collection one, your vendor that hold the vendor that holds your data is compromised and bad guys get your data. Number two, your vendor is used as a launching pad to attack its customers, you. Um, and, we, you know, we actually saw that um, in uh, the uh, the Kronos attack, um, you know, where where, you know, the bad guys got into uh, to some healthcare networks. Uh, three, your technology vendor has its product backdoored. And Mike, that's SolarWinds. Um, and then your vendor goes offline, impacting a key capability. So no, you know, no data is lost, no you know, impact on you, but you lose the thing that you bought from that vendor. You know, th so those are the four things that happen. And Mike Omvig uh, uh, from Skagit County, you know, as we were planning this, you talked about the, the things that you've seen go wrong. Can you go through these? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I want to start off with some contractual. I saw some language in the chat about some contractual things here. Um, it's an interesting field right now. And so it's not really a relationship that I'm going to talk about between uh, like myself and another agency, but myself and a software vendor is what I'm really going to go at here. Um, so what are the, the challenges that we're seeing with uh, software industry and their subscription agreements is depending on the amount of money you're spending and a, a risk level, they may not be willing to negotiate with you. And, and so we're seeing what happened with the old uh, EULAs, which is, you know, the end user license agreement, how those 
uh, you know, you pull them out of the box, you threw them in the trash, you never read them. Well, that's starting to happen. You're starting to see that in the subscription industry. So, so we're starting to see where things aren't very negotiable, like liability, identification, notification, those kinds of things. Um, also, software is a defect. Uh, I think that it should be everybody's contract is that you have that, that if the software has a security vulnerability, it's a defect of the software and should be fixed by the vendor. Um, I'm seeing pushback now by by the um, vendor community on that issue. They don't want to they don't want to say that a vulnerability is a defect and therefore they have to fix it. They want to try to um, manage the situation and and they're reluctant to to put that publicly on a document. So uh, contractual pushback is happening in the industry. And I, I think all of us on the call are, are the only ones that can fix that uh, is by starting to say, no, if you're gonna do business with us, there's certain things you need to have in your software contracts. The disruption of services. We had a, a, a vendor oh, uh, recently about six months ago actually get ransomware, uh, completely dropped our services. We were not able to get in, use our system, nothing. And since that has happened, they were able to get back and restore. It took them a couple months before they were able to get back online and restored services, but they never came back to, to where they were before. Uh, support help desk is non-functional. Uh, we, got, we got challenges in billing. They billed us for stuff we'd already paid for. Um, it, it was just a mess. And so uh, working through all of that became difficult. Reach. Hey, hey, and Mike, hey, Mike, I got a question for you on that one. Sure. So, you know, for that period of time when, you know, they weren't providing the services that you had contracted them for, did they stop billing you? Did you have to pay for it? Did they forgive any no, of it? They never stopped billing us, uh, never forgave us for any of that, um, never did really anything. I, I, I think it really messed them up. <laughs> Did they have a service level agreement that you could fall back on and at least get some kind of, you know? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Um, I don't remember going back and looking at, at that specifically. Uh, most vendors do have service, but I probably managed 200 vendors. And so yeah. I don't remember on that one specifically. And I think um, that, and by the way, you know, I think that's very common. I was talking to a, an IT director uh, uh, last week and I said, you know, how many vendors do you manage? Uh, and he said, you know, four or five hundred um they're you know a large organization but you know that, that's a lot it's a lot so sorry mike i interrupted you go ahead yeah no i'm just a medium-sized county and, and i've got two to three hundred vendors yep you know and um and that becomes that becomes a challenge to manage and i'll get into one of those issues here on number four there but i i've been through a breach um we've seen it uh it's very 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 painful and so I think people don't understand the amount of pain that you go through when one of these happens. And you basically um, stand up an incident management team because you're gonna have public interested, you gotta do notifications. There's a whole lot of stuff you gotta do legally. Uh, we, uh, when in the breach that we went through, we actually stood up and had about 30 people working up for about three weeks. So that gives you any kind of feeling. And that was only 1500 records. And so, um, if that gets any fully, any idea how big that gets and how fast that gets. And this is, you know, uh, well before the Washington breach laws that have gone into effect and other breach laws, this is back 10 years ago. Um, and so now we have a lot more reporting that we need to do under breach. Uh, and the last one, it's just getting vendors to fix software vulnerabilities. I mean, you run your vulnerability scanner and there's 15 different things that come up on the vulnerability scanner for critical you report that into them, and then that's the last you ever hear of those tickets. They go into the, the bucket. You never know if those get fixed or not, and you're, you know, you kind of beat on them. Often those get closed. Uh, we've had those experiences. It's been a very frustrating uh, time to try to get vendors to actually fix anything. Um, so, you know, I, I think if they get enough press, they'll fix it. Um, but other than that, that's been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. And I mean, you know, as as and Fred, you know, as we look at these, um, you know, these, you know, these are probably pretty common uh, pain points around folks. You know, Mike Olmvig, I don't think you or uh, you didn't say you've dealt with one where the vendor is breached and then that becomes a jumping off point for the bad guy to get into your network. Um, but that certainly happens. Um, uh, I mean, Fred, you've seen that a lot. Uh, yeah, well, that's the classic target breach where an HVAC vendor got compromised and they used that as a pathway in, to, you know, through remote access into target. 
and then had one of the largest retail breaches of that decade. So yeah, that that's that's a, a very common approach to uh, another one was a fish tank. Uh, they uh, had, had an aquarium vendor and they took over the fish tank, uh, the computer system running the fish tank and use that as the jumping off point. So any connection, anytime you have a vendor connection, we're gonna talk about that later, what it means to have these kinds of connections um, is it, a risk and you need to manage that risk. Yeah, and Jake, uh, if I could jump in yeah, real please. quick on that. Yeah. I and mean, we had a, a local city in, a, in Washington state get compromised and uh, they got completely owned. And six months later, we're getting attacked out of a nation state with all the information that came out of that breach that they had you know, jumping in the middle of conversations, trying to say, yeah, remember that project we were working on? Hey, download this malware. Uh, that actually happens. Was that a state agency that got compromised? I think it was a state. No, it was, believe- it was not a state agency no? that got compromised. It was a small city. Okay. Because there was that okay. time the state they- agency was compromised. And then they said, oh, our bad. So everybody gets free monitoring on us, right? Yeah, there was that one. And on this particular situation, uh, there wasn't any free monitoring. It just six months later, Skagit wow. County was under attack from what I believe was a nation state. And it was targeted, very well-crafted emails, jumping in the middle of conversations, saying, hey, Joe, remember that thing we were working on? Hey, do over here and download this list. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, that stuff happens too. Yeah. And, yeah. and Mark, you know, Mark puts a a uh, question in the chat about, you know, the vendors, vendors getting breached, right? How to address, uh, you know, a SaaS company where the vendor u- utilizes third and fourth parties for cloud storage. Um, we're seeing that. And I think we'll get into that a little bit. But Fred, you want to address that briefly before we get to the next sure. slide? Uh, I, I like to use the payment card industry. The credit card standards is a great method to say that everything that you push to your vendor in your contract also needs to be required that they push those same exact requirements down to their vendors. So you have this requirement that whatever you pass to them must also be passed contractually down to subcontractors or sub vendors to that. So that's that's how the credit card industry has been handling that for 20 years and it works. Yeah, yeah. I wanna make a point about uh, point number one there. Um, so this is one thing that the federal government is trying to address through this national cybersecurity strategy, where they're trying to move the responsibility for product security onto product vendors and manufacturers rather than the end users. So, you know, software defects, um, you know, this is this is coming up uh, a lot in conversation right now through this software bill of materials that the federal government wants everything to track back so that we understand if there's a vulnerability in an open source component that's implemented in your software, you deal with that. And that when you release a product, it is secure out of the box, demonstrably secure out of the box. It's got a method for identifying vulnerabilities going into the future and a method for ensuring that patches and updates get into the hands of the users. If when all that finally comes to pass and because Congress has to do some things to make that happen, it's an if, um, a lot of that will be abated. So, I, you know, that is a problem now. It's being worked on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Um, all right, Fred, how, how, how should folks prepare? We know this yeah. is going to happen. So what do you do? Sure. So contracting is key. Uh, if you're in the healthcare world, you're familiar with business associate agreements. Probably the first time uh, the government said, you need to have contracts with your vendors to protect data, full stop. So that's why this where it comes from. But it's any agreement. Your procurement department is where security starts. So we tell this to everybody we talk to, make sure procurement realizes they are the pointy tip of the spear. If they are not asking for the right things, when they're going out to procure things, putting together the requirements list they need for security and taking those requirements and incorporating them into a contract or a business associate agreement. There is a fantastic document that I've recommended for years called Data Security Contract Clauses for Service Provider Provider Agreements and in parentheses pro customers because it's written from the customer perspective by a company called Practical Law. And it is literally a compendium of all the clauses you should be considering when you are negotiating an agreement. And it covers all these different aspects, protecting your data, protecting your infrastructure, 
how they should react if there's a breach. All these things need to be covered and it's a very complex set of requirements. So you need to put time to make sure your contracts cover everything. You may also say that, um, look, if, um, if you have a uh, cause a failure that causes us to lose data, um, that you are liable up to the amount of the cost of the services delivered. That is industry standard. That is in limits of liability contracts. That is the the term terminology they used to say. Listen, you know we're not you're, we're not going to pay you in damages more than the services that we delivered are. Now that doesn't mean that if you are negligent and then errors and omissions insurance kicks in, that is a different thing, right? But the limits of liability for any contract should be the services delivered. So understand that. There needs to be a, a process to manage vendors, third parties, people you have inner uh, data sharing and exchange agreements with. All these people are your third parties and you need to have a process. And I'm gonna have a slide that's gonna describe what it means to truly holistically look at your vendor management process and execute that effectively. You should have uh, the ability to respond rapidly, right? So you should be ready to understand what it means to, if your vendor has a breach, how does that fit onto your IR plan? Because it doesn't have to be you that gets breached where you have to execute your IR plan because it's somebody else has lost your data and you still need to respond. So understand what that entire process is. Understand how you fit into your vendor's IR plan. Ask them, what happens when you have an incident? Are we notified? What does your IR plan do for us? And lastly, understand uh, what your insurance coverage is. Does your insurance cover what happens at a third party? There are two types now. There's cyber liability insurance and data breach insurance. Some of those, now there's a split and you may need two policies to have coverage and only one of those may be the one that covers third party risk. So very complex web of legal requirements and kind of assurance processes you need to run. And Fred, uh, Fred, and Fred in there mentioned a, uh, a legal document. Um, and if you shoot me an email, jake at criticalinsight.com, I'll get you that link when Fred gets it to me after the webinar. Uh, go ahead, Mike, sorry. Uh, one point for our friends in healthcare. So uh, it's, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, NIST 800-66R2, release two, okay. This has just been modified, upgraded, whatever they call it. Um, and it stipulates now that your incident response planning process has to involve third parties that may possess your records or perform a service for you that touches those records. So it's all about EPHI, but still it's, it's exactly what Fred said, incident response process now starting to be regulated as something that needs to extend out to your vendors. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. And, you know, there's uh, a question that came up in the chat a little bit here that I want to ask you yeah. about, which is so so Jennifer is talking about being affected by the Wolverine breach. Vendors, vendor affected. They were supposed to notify in 30 days. They took more than 70 days to notify us. So they're out of compliance. Um, you know, if they end up getting a fine, you know, do they have to pay it? Can they pass it on to, to Wolverine? Fred I or Mike, how's that work? I'll just tell you what happened with Blackbot, and there's another one called Fortra, okay, which was another um, uh, third party that did a lot of processing for uh, healthcare in particular. Um, so what happens is everybody's go on the wall of shame, and everybody's got to file their breach report. And regardless of whether or not there are fines, there's still damage that's been done to the organization. These all end up in class action suits. So Blackbot and Fortra are just getting their pants sued off right now. Yeah. So that's one way of dealing with that. Yep. Yep. All right. Let's. Uh, um, so Fred, managing vendor access, super important here. Yeah. So when you're letting, so let's talk remote access first. Remote access should not be a continuous, always on, hey, we've given them a VPN connection and account. That is not appropriate way to manage vendor remote access. It should be, they call up. They say, I'm going to perform these particular activities. I want to do it on Thursday morning from between 10 and noon. Um, and you say, okay, we will enable access for that particular activity during that period. Please contact us when you've completed your work 
so we can immediately close that access back off. Nobody should have an open front door that they can walk in. People change uh, jobs at vendors. Their credentials may be handed to somebody else. They're not positive, even if you have a policy that you're saying not to do that, what, what's actually going on. So you need to be in control. The other way to do this is have a hosted session. Use something like Teams or uh, a WebEx session where you're hosting the session, you're monitoring the session in real time, and you're then giving them selective access to take control of the mouse and click on things and, and do the things they need. But really, you know, it's, it's either a short period of time where it's fully supervised, right? You should never say, hey, yeah, you can do this anytime you want. Um, on-prem access. So people are pretty lax about this. Um, the things that you should absolutely have is if you're going to bring a system or a device on and plug it into our network or on to uh, a system, we have like a USB device, that that new USB device, for example, be devoted entirely to you as the client and it's never used on any other systems other than the system they have and the one they're transferring it to you. Or alternatively, that their laptops, if they're going to plug in on your network or plug in to a device to do a firmware upgrade, possibly, that that system has some set of security controls that are commensurate with what you would expect for any system that is brought onto your network. And make sure they're not using shared passwords. Make sure you're never giving a vendor a single account where anybody in their organization can use it because now you've lost any auditable trail, right? We don't know who did it. It was maybe the guy they fired or maybe it was somebody that's still there. We just don't know. That's a situation you never want to be in. Yeah. I mean, there might be a large accounting firm that we found is using, you know, the password accounting firm name one and then accounting name yeah. two and on and on and on as their passwords when they when they log into a system that's not There's good also the, like that. the, the, th the thing that happened in a, a hospital where a vendor came in to perform maintenance on an mri machine with a compromised computer remember that yep and, and the the other obvious one here is always always mfa anytime you're doing remote access multi-factor authentication if you're logging into a system with administrative access you should be locked down to multi-factor authentication. That is a, you know, you lose that password and havoc ensues. So a lot of people don't do that, but you should. Anytime you're using a, an administrative level account, it should have multi-factor authentication. So Fred, what, what do folks do when it happens? Okay. Well, I think Mike is going to tell us. Oh, sorry, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mike is going to tell us about this. So first of all, when your when your vendor raises a hand and, or or you detect that there's some kind of outage going on, you if they say something about it, you need to kind of read between the lines sometimes and think about what it means to you. Is that vendor supplying a product that you operate? Is that vendor a SaaS provider where you are uh, engaging in a lot of network traffic going back and forth, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, given all of these things that are happening legally, contractually, regulatorily, um, um, you need to evaluate exactly what's going on um, with that vendor when they when they say something to you, because it's probably not going to be the full unobfuscated story of what's happening. It's going to be a coded message. All right. So and then again, right. What do they mean to your company? Are they holding records of yours? Are they are they uh uh, 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 providing financial services to the extent that, you know, there could be some kind of fraud involved, business email compromise, something like that, right? Uh, or is it a law firm that holds your intellectual property, right? That could be a big deal. That could be existential if you're a startup. What type of incident is it? Um, is, is your vendor, you know, snuffed from ransomware and now they're dealing with their insurance company and trying to get back to work? Um, or is this uh, uh, records that have been pulled out? Indeterminate may even be worse. Indeterminate may be, we found somebody in here, we didn't know what they were doing. They could have been modifying source code for a product that you operate. So, uh, you know, all of these questions are extremely important to ask and to engage your third party. Um, does your insurance company or the SEC or 
800-62-66R2, do they say that you have to notify on a third-party incident? Because increasingly, that is becoming the trend, right? It's Jake and I have been talking for a long time about security as a competitive differentiator and how everybody has to show your papers if you're going to do business with somebody. We, everybody's got to know about your security. Um, uh, and again, right, especially if you're in healthcare, HIPAA says if it happens to somebody else, you got to say something, right? If, if they are holding your records in particular, so another one of these third parties that's doing financial processing or they're providing uh, um, um, uh, electronic health record services, right? And that's happened recently too. They're going after EHR systems a lot. Um, then you have to notify, and we have a little chat going on here about exactly that, how sometimes if the vendor doesn't notify within the window and then you have to go notify uh, OCR, you they may find you, the covered entity. So there's and, a lot and, of things to think through when this happens. And one of those is go re review your own insurance policies and make sure you know where this is going. Yeah. And by the way, one of the reasons that we like to talk about healthcare is not just that we have uh, a, a lot of healthcare clients, but also because of the public breach notification that's a little bit different for healthcare. Um, you know, that's the way that every, you know, we've talked before, we think that's the way things are going to go. Um, so even if you're not in healthcare, pay attention to the regulations in healthcare. Um, you know, let me go back to the first one here. And Mike Omvig, I'm curious, your take, the parsing the vendor's announcement. You know, we're having an IT outage or, you know, we're having an issue. You know, when you've when you've had vendors, you know, are they that have incidents? Are they transparent? Are they clear? Is do they let you know at the first inkling, or do they wait until they know everything, and by then it's too late? You know, what have what have you felt? It, it really comes down to the uh, maturity level of the vendor. Uh, you know, there are vendors out there that are very good about telling you what's going on, and and uh, you know, in plain English, you know, stuff you can understand. And there are vendors like the gal that that was 70 days later, she found out about it, you know, so it really comes down to the, the how good is that vendor with uh, uh, maturity. And so one of the things that we do in an RFP process that might help here is we ask about the, the maturity level of a vendor. We ask some questions about security. Do they have a security program? Do they do they have, do they have to train their developers on security processes and stuff like that? How long do they have it? How is it in place? Um, you know, what kind of attestation do you have about your performance under security that you can provide to us? And do you have SOC reports and things like that? So we started actually starting to ask those questions to the procurement side. And, and as those vendors are answering those well, you tend to have a vendor that's going to be more responsive to you uh, in, when they have an incident. Yeah. So again, show your papers. And, and, right, papers. and, you know, and Mike Hamilton, you actually have a, a spreadsheet of questions that we ask vendors. Um, uh, as the person who runs marketing, I can tell you there's a lot of marketing things that I want to buy that I think are really cool uh, uh, that Hamilton says no to. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy to send out that list as well. Um, and it's, and, and I'll check it with Mike Omvig. I think it might be the same kinds of questions he asks, uh, he asks. I think Mike's are a little more detailed about, you know, maturity level and things like that. But, you know, these, these questionnaires and what we're going to land on here in a minute is Fred's going to go through a process for third party risk management and what the, 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 the base, yeah. right. If, if a vendor cannot demonstrate any other way that they have, you know, some kind of certification or a report from an auditor or a third party assessment report. Here's my God awful spreadsheet for you to fill out. Right. So right. that's, that's really the last priority. That's the one you don't want to use, but yeah, there, there's plenty of questionnaires around. I mean, you can Google them up. They're easy enough to find. We'll send you the one that we use. Yeah. Just don't ask chat GPT. Um, or maybe yeah. do, I don't know. I haven't lasted it uh, about that, but you know, the other one that's in here is insurance company and, and, you know, so as Mike said, he and I have done a lot of work uh, in the insurance world. And by that, I mean helping customers that are dealing with their insurance companies and the like. And, you know, a lot of them do have a breach notification rule, Mike, 
about, hey, you got to tell us within 24, 48, 72 hours. And we know of one organization that had a really hard time getting, they ended up getting it, but getting paid back by their insurance because they didn't tell the insurance company for a week because it wasn't clear that they didn't, they weren't 100% sure they were having a breach because it came from a third party. Um, and so, you, you know, you really do have to pay attention to those things, right, Mike? Which Mike you talking to? Oh, you, Mike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. good, very good. Thanks. All right, mm -hmm. Fred, the aftermath. Yeah, I think Mike's going to do the aftermath as well. Yeah, why don't I do this too? So, um, so this one, your leverage in responsible disclosure. So this is an actual event that I'm, I'm and I'm not going to share the details on this, but so vendors product, and I'll just, I'll just tell you, it's a log 4j vulnerability in some vendors product. Okay. And, um, you know, vulnerability scan turns this thing up. It's being exploited all over the place and letting that vendor know your product has a defect, a flaw, and you need to fix it. And if that goes unanswered, all right, it is perfectly legal and reasonable to say, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 60 days or 30 days or whatever you, whatever you want to give them. And if this isn't fixed, I'm making it public. That's called responsible disclosure. And so this is a way where you can twist the arms of your vendors if you need to, when you have found something wrong with their product, whether or not it's been backdoored or something, like, any flaw that you find, right? Some defect in the, in the product. If it's a secure, if there's a security issue around it, you are perfectly okay doing responsible disclosure. Don't I, do it the other way because they'll sue the crap out of you. Yes. Yeah. I, I would suggest though, if it is a zero day, you do not want to be disclosing a zero day to the world if no. there is no fix. Okay. Yeah. If there's no fix. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, a log 4J vulnerability, okay, it's it's fixable. They just didn't do it. Okay. You know. Um, contractual obligations. Uh, really, you're gonna have to dive into contracts and see exactly who is required to do what here um, to try and limit your own liability as much as you can. Um, you know, I, I don't mean, you know, putting all of this on the third party, on the vendor, uh, but you got to figure out what they're going to take care of and what you're going to take care of, especially in one of those instances where records get disclosed and you are the ultimate owner of those records. And so regardless of who's at fault here, you're going to sustain the brand damage. So look at those contractual obligations and make sure that there is some kind of way to recoup, as Fred said, at least the cost of how much money you spend with that vendor every year, for example. Um, and, insurance and, and, hey, issues. I wanna, and I want to stop on the contractual obligations for mm -hmm. a second. So, you know, uh, at this point, you know, folks should have a buying process. But, you know, what do you do? And Mike, Omvig, I don't know if you've dealt with this. What do you do if, you know, somebody's bought something? And, you know, there's no good language in the contract. Do you then go back to the to the vendor and say, hey, we need to renegotiate this? Do you just live with the risk? What do you do? Both. Um, I think we try to ne renegotiate if possible. Uh, you know, we, we don't bring those things up. The other option is to go back and uh, at some point in the future, go on to some other system that, that will work with you. I mean, that's an option as well. The third thing is do, you know, some sort of a, uh, fill the gaps somehow, uh, pull the data. I mean, one of the things that we do contractually, and I think everybody should be doing contractually, even with these SaaS providers, is pull your data down. Because that SaaS provider could go away tomorrow and you don't know. I mean, that happened to us where the, the vendor just disappeared. We were fine because we were pulling our data down every day. And so we had our data when they got ransomware. And fortunately, in that particular instance, uh, that vendor, I mean, none of that data was confidential data. And so we didn't have really a breach or anything. Um, but yeah, you start having to take some measures to mitigate that vendor. Um, we've, we've shut down services to our to, to an online uh, system that we had because of the Fort Log4j vulnerability in one of our vendor products. And they would not fix it. And so we shut it down. We actually had CI security come in and do an assessment on the system to make sure that we were OK bringing it back up. And so those are things we've had to do to mitigate when vendors don't play nice in the sandbox. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, Mr. Hamilton, you may continue. 
Okay, insurance issues. Um, the I think the, the main one that's in scope here is um, the the cyber liability. And, and interestingly, it's whether or not your third party who has notified you of some kind of incident or breach or something like that, do they have liability, the cyber liability insurance, right? Because if they're liable, then they, their policy will cover you. And that's what you want. That might be something that you want to stipulate in contracts, depending on what that vendor does for you, that we want you to have cyber liability, right? Third party protection in case you get hacked and it lands on us, all right? And then finally, you know, rebuilding trust with a vendor. Some vendors get fired, some skate through this. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing that we have observed that when there is a large uh, breach or event or incident at uh, a publicly traded corporation, their stock will immediately tank. As soon as that becomes public, it will go down. Pro tip, that's a buying opportunity because it's going to bounce back just in a couple of days. Every time, every time we have seen this over and over and over and over. All right. Now, we are not financial advisors. All investments take on risk. Okay. So, but yeah, you're going to have to rebuild trust with a vendor because, um, you know, if, if they are super sloppy and it's, it's demonstrated they're super sloppy, you may want to think about another supplier for your product. And again, right, breach notification requirements. If you are regulated soon to be, this is probably going to be almost everybody. There will be mandatory requirements. Circea yeah. is the one from Homeland Security that um, talks about critical infrastructure. So if you're in one of the critical sectors, you're, you're already in scope. So there you go. Yeah, and Mark in the chat is, you know, saying your insurance contract may stipulate requirements of doing business with a, you know, with a vendor with good security. Um, the That's interesting. And, I haven't seen and, that. That's interesting. And and Fred, you know, one, you know, on the other side of this, you know, we've gotten calls from companies that have had breaches that, you know, their customers won't let them back in the network. And they say to us, hey, will you help us get a clean bill of health? Yeah, well, it's... <laughs> So that's usually an emergency uh, situation where they're trying to get back uh, back to some level of security and secure operations. Uh, but it, usually the insurance companies uh, now have a breach advisor that they're deploying on this that's going to be monitoring everything. And they're not going to pull out uh, assisting that client until they feel their liability has at least been covered in the process. Sure, sure. If they have cyber insurance. If they have it. I think Mark's uh, comment here was interesting on that with the stipulating the requirements back on the vendor. I've not seen that either, Mike. I have no. seen it where the cyber insurance industry is coming back on us and saying that you have to take certain control measures to, to make, remain insured. And so I'm seeing that, but I haven't seen what Mark's seen. Yeah, well, that, so that is super interesting. And if I'm an insurance company, that's what I'm telling people, right? You can only do business with people who show you their papers and convince you that their security controls are up to snuff. Yeah, for sure. Which is a great lead into the next slide. It is. Which as soon as it comes way. up, I'm going to talk about it. So yeah, how, how, do you, how do you take all this stuff and how do you build a program? Right, because this is a program. People managing your third-party vendors is not a one, one and done. It's a program that happens continuously. So, we give you some some recommendations. Build the tool. Maybe it's you know if you're a small organization, you build a, a, a spreadsheet in Excel and have some way to manage the data and score the data and and update the data. Um, maybe you get a service. There are plenty of services. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're uh, an MDR customer of ours, we're probably going to start providing you with a tool to do this kind of uh, this kind of uh, management of security of third parties. Um, Risk-based assessment, right? You you want to figure out how are we going to figure out are these people meeting the bar? Now we talked about questionnaires, right? That's a, a great way to do this. Probably should have some level of scoring and tiering. For example. Uh, the people that come in and sweep the floors at night are probably a different type of vendor than the people I'm outsourcing my EPHI to be processed as a software as a service. So maybe I have different levels of the same sort of thing. Maybe it's the five question for the small vendor, the 500 question or 50 question for the uh, major vendor that really is rely your whole business is relying on. So you, you want to tier these things. And you probably want to uh, have some way to require them to tell you 
how they're doing over the time of the contract. So you look to the right hand side here. If you look at the top, that whole top blue box is all about that's that first step. Let's find out what the security level is. Let's measure them against something appropriate for what they're doing. And then let's say this vendor is appropriate and we will contract with them. This vendor can be appropriate to contract with if they remediate these couple of vulnerabilities or they maybe are not. And for the ones that do get certified, if you will, or you're allowed to contract with, hopefully you build something in there that has some level of reporting. Like, hey, you have to tell us if you uh, have any zero day vulnerabilities that are exposed to the internet uh, on your system. You have to notify us. Or maybe it's, you have to do quarterly vulnerability scans, maybe external only, maybe internal. You may have to negotiate to allow people to give you a little bit more visibility into what's happening. But you do wanna have some way to know have they made wholesale changes? Have they done things that have impacted the security of your organization? That's the more difficult part of this is that post-contract phase. And that's where to look at some way to have an interaction point, even if it's just, let's have a monthly 15 minute conversation about the state of security. You can get more out of that 15 minutes than probably a formal report and a monthly or quarterly vulnerability scan. So think about that back end component but get very formalized on the front end component. And of course, the contractual component we mentioned before, what's in your contract ultimately guides everything. It's just like your security policies you build for your organization. Well, the contractual components are the policies you're building in the relationship with any of the third parties you're sharing data with or that are using your data. So that's and, the approach. Good. And, Let me let ahead, me Mark. talk about the tool real quick. Um, so I'm familiar with a, a couple of tools that are used for third-party risk management. And uh, I mean, we don't we don't resell and we don't advocate anything in particular. But the one I've seen that I like is called UpGuard. And what that lets you do is you're, you're moving the responsibility onto those vendors to all input exactly the same data. And like Fred said, you can tier it. So different tiers of vendors depending on what risk they would represent your company or your uh, operational continuity, right? you can modify those things. But what it let you, lets you do is then compare them all. And it lets you group them, for example, by risk or by what they supply. So you can see if risk is concentrated in a certain, I don't know, uh, uh, semiconductor supplier or something like that. And, and which would give you the opportunity to go out and make some modifications so that you can lower that risk. So that's use of a tool. I've seen some tools that work pretty well at this. Um, and hey, Mike, what was the name of the one that you liked most there? And Fred, do you have one that you like people are asking? Yeah, we, we internally, we use CyberSaint as the tool to, yeah. uh, to do that. Yeah, and and you know if folks engage with us for third-party risk assessment or or anything, I think we you know we can help you get into CyberSaint. Um, uh, and uh, and of course others are UpGuard and and the like. There's another uh, conversation thread in the chat, which is um, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, you know, said it'd be great if there was a nationally accepted questionnaire. Had one vendor try to charge me to complete the survey. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but but I mean that is a question you know I mean why isn't there a nationally well, accepted questionnaire or I mean well, is that becoming like you know just aligned with NIST CSF right exactly no. that's it well it, that's what we would say I will say there are standards organizations um, actually I've been part of both of them uh, one is the uh, sharedassessments.org which is now a private corporation it used to be a public entity i used to assist them in building their uh what was called the bits FISAP. it was for finance banking it security oh, bits. um bits and it was FISAP, the uh the third party assessment program for banking so we built all the standards for that organization it is now moved into a public you know uh, or a, a private organization serving uh serving industry but it's incredibly expensive and all the things you see on this slide here are represented in the process. So it's extremely robust, very enterprise focused. Same thing in healthcare. We have the High Trust Alliance, formerly the uh, Alternate Controls Committee Chairman for the High Trust Alliance, helped actually build that organization almost 15 years ago. 
Um, and that is also another organization that started out being somewhat kind of public focus, became private, and now is a standards, uh, a third party attestation organization that will assess you, measure you against criteria, and then tell the world, your healthcare world, here's how you measure up against your competitors. So they're out there, but they're very expensive. They're incredibly rigorous, very costly to go through if you're part of it. Um, and it really caters to the enterprise world. And probably that's not who we're talking to here today. And, you know, I mean, I had a conversation with one of our, you know, a couple of our uh, uh, compliance audit partners, uh, Moss Adams and uh, uh, and Shellman, you know, and, you know, if somebody, you know, if somebody has a SOC 2 um, or, you know, one of those, you know, does that, you know, do you then just give them a green light? Um, you know, I guess you have to actually, read. you got to go, you got to go through it and you gotta read it because <laughs> they're rarely perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can discern things through, uh, the language used by the auditor sometimes is, you know, and, but, you know, I mean, for the most part, if you go through the thing and it's no exceptions noted, no exceptions noted, and make sure that you understand which trust principles you're looking at because they can be different. Also understand the scope because you write your own scope statement when you're going to engage SOC 2 auditors and you can narrow that thing down to only customer data that we hold, for example. So know, know what you're talking about know what's trust principles where uh, they've been evaluated against and then look for no exceptions noted all the way through the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from, oh, and Mike Omfig, I'm curious, you know, from your standpoint, you know, if somebody brings you a, you know, a SOC 2 report, um, SOC 2 type 2, you know, does that satisfy you or do you, how deep do you go into it? Um, th that is just one data point for us you know we're going to look at like again we're going back do they have they have a security program do they uh you know what's the encryption look like you know to and from you know um so we're going to go more than just the SOC report we're going to look at other elements of their of what they do and how they do it um you know have they had a breach you know have, have they have they been good about notifying people about vulnerabilities and things like that. So, you know, what's, what's the company doing and how is that doing more than just the data center side of that? It's the, you know, how are they managing the security as well? So we try to get into a lot more than just, you know, what's happening at the data center layer. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and uh, Fred, a question from Darcy, um, are SAS financial systems required to do SOC one or SOC two reports? They're not required to. Um, it's certainly a great idea. And if you're probably a SaaS financial system, you probably want to be maybe the Cloud Security Alliance, the CCM um, is a certification or something like FedRAMP slash StateRAMP um, is a high level of attestation as well for a cloud-based software as a service. So there are, there are a number of things. ISO 27001 is another highly useful certification. Not fully software as a surface focused, but applicable nonetheless. And yeah. is high trust still a thing? I mean, high trust was a kind high of trust a is still a thing. thing. It's still yeah. a thing. It's, I've never run into anybody that's got a high trust certification. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's really the major hospital chains and their suppliers like Cerner or Baxter or, okay. you know, the, the giants Epic. amongst the giants kind of thing. So, um, you know, as we, uh, uh, as we get towards the end here, and I see there are a couple of questions in the chat, you know, I, I do want to make a couple of points. Number one is um, at towards the end of all of these, we like to give people a survey because we really want to know how did we do. Um, we do a lot of events. We want feedback from folks. My colleague Jenny is going to put a link to the uh, to the survey in the chat. And as far as I know, SurveyMonkey has not had a breach this week, um, so it's okay to click the link. Um, and for everybody who fills out the survey, um, we do a donation to the Society for Information Management, which helps train folks on all of this. Um, and we, we, you know, we really, uh, we really appreciate when folks take the survey. Um, <clears throat> second is if folks ever want to meet with us uh, to talk about any of this, you can either 
you know, mention that in the survey, email me or my colleague is going to put a link in the chat with a calendar thing. If you're kind of the person, if you're the kind of person who likes to just pick a time on a calendar, you know, as we look at, you know, what we do, you know, a lot of what we talked about today um, is in, you know, regulatory compliance. We do third party risk management. Obviously, we do MDR, which is watching your network. So if the bad guys get in through a vendor, uh, you know, we'll see it. Um, and then our incident response. Um, and as I said, you know, we've we've responded to incidents from, uh, you know, from some of the folks who've been breached as well. Um, so just want you to know that we're, you know, we're always there to help. Um, and another thing Mike mentioned in the very beginning, his, um, uh, his daily blast, if you go to our website, you'll see Mike's picture on the bottom. You can sign up for his emails that he sends uh, uh, you know, that he sends every morning relentlessly um, about all the news of the day. He sends it Monday through Friday. We always have security awareness training on our website. And now I want to get to the questions that were in the chat uh, that I missed while I was talking there. Um, let's see here. Um, you talked about transparency before. Circling back to it, are you aware of vendors who try to cover up bre breaches by paying extortion demands of hackers? Um, do you think that happens? I do think that happens. And I think, you know, this, the whole extortion thing is wildly underreported. And, you know, when your insurance company is in there and they're helping you and you are not regulated and not required to report something like that, it's unlikely that you're going to do that voluntarily <laughs> if you can cover it up. And yes, Uber is the poster child for that and the CISO there. That actually, you know, they threatened him with jail time and, and enormous fines quietly the rest of the c-suite was excused because their fingerprints were on that too and they were going to get uh accused of uh, uh you know liability here gross negligence and you know nobody wants that so they all disappear that's what happened at target too fred brought up target that that was the first time that the c-suite disappeared for uh, a, a, a cyber event yeah Hey, Mike, I think that when we had our vendor get ransomware, uh, we found out by calling them and saying what happened to our services. We never got a notice that said that we got ransomware, and we found out that they had paid the ransom after. There the you fact. go. There you yep. go. Yep. Then there you, and 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 I've seen that happen, and I know that it happened with one organization that we talked to. Same thing that you saw, Mike Olmvig, uh, that they found out you know, only because the service stopped working and they called and they said, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, <laughs> forgot. Um, okay, so let's do some final thoughts here. Um, and I put my email address up on the screen. Uh, there were a couple of documents mentioned in this webinar, Fred's legal document, uh, Mike Hamilton's spreadsheet of questions to ask vendors, um, and, uh, and obviously the slides from this presentation. Um, and we'll make sure to send that out to folks. Uh, let's do final thoughts. Uh, we'll start with Mike Omvig, then Hamilton, then Fred. Go ahead, Mike Omvig, final thoughts for folks. Um, you know, just my uh, soapbox is, you know, let's start with the small cities, small counties, get them, you know, do something nationally to get them as resilient as possible because uh, they're the ones that don't have any resources to get anything done. And they're the ones where the attacks are coming from for us. And so, you know, that if we're going to have a national strategy, I think we should start, you know, bottom up, not top down, which is what our strategy seems to be top down at the moment. Just my thought. Mike Hamilton. Do everything you can with third party risk management contracts and insurance policies, but be aware that the federal government is pulling this lever as well and things may get better as a result of that and not make you have to do so much work. All right, Fred, final thoughts. Yeah, um, procurement and contracting are part of your security team. In fact, they're a critical part of your security team. If you're not managing it as part of that, you're going to have problems. So put them front and center. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, we'd love feedback. Don't forget to take that survey uh, that, uh, that Jenny put in the chat. It's always good seeing everybody. Happy Flag Day and have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.